Hello cruel world, my name is Dr. Shaham Das. I'm a consultant forensic psychiatrist. I assess mentally disordered offenders for a living so that you don't have to. Now, if you're watching this video, I'm sure that you've heard about the tragic events that unfolded very recently on the 13th of June. So in this video, I'm gonna talk about that. I'm gonna tell you what we know about what's happened so far, which is not a lot, I have to say. My suspicions of what's going on with the perpetrator, specifically if he is mentally ill, and if so, what does that mean? Like, how would he be assessed? What does the future hold for that individual rehabilitation, prison, etc.? Before I do any of that, I just want to share my condolences with the victims. I want to name the victims because despite what this video is about, they are at the heart of it and I just don't want to forget them, basically. So they are Grace O. Malikuma, 19, student, medical student. In fact, I was one of those once, so that really hits home for me. Barnaby Weber, 19, also a student history, was a good cricketer, and Ian Coates, age 65. So again, my condolences come goes out to their family. Just the parents of the students especially, can you imagine what it must be like to send your kids off at the age of 18 and then that happen? Anyway, heartbreaking. So moving on, I'll tell you what I know. So I'm recording this just the day after it happened, so I'm sure more details will come out with time. But right now we know that <clears throat> yesterday morning, 13th of June, at 4 a.m., two students were found dead, stabbed to death. And then at 5 a.m., just two miles away, the other man was found dead, Ian Coates, and the perpetrator stole his van and used it to mow down three people at a bus stop at about 5.30 a.m. We don't know that much about the perpetrator. I'll tell you what we do know, which is that he's 31 years old. He's of West African origin. He's not a British citizen, but he's been here for a long time, many years. He's got no previous criminal record and he's not known to security services, obviously suggesting that he's not a known terrorist. We also know that he has mental health issues. Now, that can mean a range of different things and it could be a red herring, but we'll get into that. So, what do I think's going on? Why did he do what he did? Obviously, there's a degree of speculation because I only know what I've just told you, but here are the possibilities in my head. It could be an act of terror, a terrorist. I think that's unlikely and I'll explain why. I think it's too random and there's nothing symbolic about what he did or where he did it. And that's kind of what terrorists do because they've got a political agenda. Also, no group has claimed responsibility, which makes me think that it wasn't associated with like a terrorist cell. It could be that the perpetrator didn't have a mental illness and just randomly decided to go on like a killing spree. Now, I'm sure some of you hearing this will be thinking, well, hang on, if he did that, then surely by definition he has a mental illness. I'm not going to go into it now because it's a whole different topic and I've done videos on this in the past, but I'm talking about a mental illness like a psychotic illness where somebody's not in control of their actions, as opposed to what could be the case here, which is a personality disorder. So if somebody's a psychopath, they can become agitated and just go out in, the killing, in a killing spree. But I suppose the difference is they, they know what they're doing. It's not like a mental illness has changed their baseline. If you've got a personality disorder, then, then that is part of your personality. So to be specific, because what I'm saying is quite vague, um, people that don't have mental illnesses who have been on killing sprees include Joseph McCann and Joanna Dennehy. Uh, I've made videos on both of them. I'll put the links if, if you're interested. Joanna Dennehy is particularly interesting to me because she's uh, the first woman to get a full life term. Uh, sorry, the third woman to get a full life term. So that's one possibility. Another possibility is it could simply be drug use because we know that drug use, especially things like alcohol, uh, alcohol and cocaine, can disinhibit certain people who are already prone to aggression. So that's one possibility. I think it's unlikely because it, it just seems too extreme for that kind of scenario. So what does that leave us with? Mental illness. That's the thing that I assess for a living and it's the thing that's probably, uh, that's my expertise and what I'm personally most interested in. So I have actually assessed cases not too dissimilar to this, high profile murder cases, which where the perpetrator has had a severe mental illness, like for example, Oxford Street stabbing in July, 2021. I'm sure you guys remember this. I assess the perpetrator of that whilst he was uh, remanded, while he was detained in a, a high secure unit. So what, do, what does that mean, mentally ill, mental, and how does that kind of affect the actions of an individual like this? Well, first of all, I just want to make the point that the vast majority of people with a mental illness are not dangerous. Just as a forensic psychiatrist, I see that small, tiny percentage that, that are dangerous. I assess them as an expert witness. So if it, was psycho if it was psychosis that drove this man in Nottingham, then it's likely to be either one of two things. Either he's suffering from auditory hallucinations, like voices telling him to attack people, 
or he has like paranoid delusions. So specifically, he might have seen these random people and in his head, in his delusional psychotic mind, he might have believed that he needed to kill them for whatever reason, they were gonna harm him. Um, in other cases, I've seen that they are like reincarnations of the devil or that he needs to do something like this to go to heaven. These might sound far-fetched to you listening to this, but I've, I've seen cases like this. Why is this relevant? Why am I talking about this? If what I suspect is true, and I am speculating, then this man will need an assessment by a forensic psychiatrist like myself, an expert witness. And there's a couple of possibilities. He could potentially be found not guilty by reason of insanity, which means in the eyes of the law, he's not guilty, but he still could be sectioned for long-term treatment and rehabilitation. I think it's unlikely in this case because the very fact that he ran away from the murder scenes and that he tried to evade police, stole a van, etc., to me suggests that he knew what he was doing was wrong. So he still could be mentally ill, but he knew what he was doing was wrong. Uh, and that's one of the tenets of not guilty by reason of insanity. So I think this is my prediction, it's very unlikely he'll get that psychiatric defence. Then there's another psychiatric defence in murder cases, specifically for murder cases, called diminished responsibility. So that changes murder to manslaughter, and it, is, it does what it says on the tin. It, it's when somebody's respons somebody is responsible, but the responsibility is lowered, it's diminished. So murder, mandatory life sentence to manslaughter. And to prove that, the, the psychiatrist must believe that the individual has a mental illness, has those symptoms and was suffering from those symptoms at the time of the killing, for example, paranoid delusions, and that's interviewing the assessment, looking at uh, transcripts of police interviews, CCTV footage, etc., etc., to the degree that they didn't understand their conduct, they literally didn't know what they're doing, unlikely in this case, they couldn't form a rational judgment or they couldn't exhibit self-control. And if the court agrees with that, then they get a charge of manslaughter rather than murder. As I said before, murder, mandatory life sentence, manslaughter is actually up to the judge. So in extreme cases, in a high profile case like this, the judge might say, well, even though he did have diminished responsibility, I'm still going to impose a life uh, sentence. That might be the judge's call, or in another case, they might say that they actually dropped the charges. I don't think that's going to happen here. I'm just letting you know the, uh, the spectrum of options for the judge. And if the court doesn't accept the defence psychiatrist's report, if he thinks that they're you know, pushing the truth or what they say is not accurate, then the court themselves, the CPS, can instruct another forensic psychiatrist, and then they, bat they both put in reports, they get sworn in, they give evidence in court, they battle it out something that I've done many times. I've worked for both the defence and the prosecution. <clears throat> so what's the potential outcome? Well, hypothetically speaking, if this man was found to have any of these psychiatric defences, then he could be transferred to a psychiatric hospital rather than prison. So the nature of his crimes almost certainly would lead him to a high secure hospital. Now you've probably heard of Broadmoor, it's probably the most infamous, but actually there's one named Rampton, which is much nearer. It's actually in Nottinghamshire, so I'm almost certain that that's where he would be sent. What does that mean? What's the difference? So a high secure hospital is still locked. People's actions are still restricted. You can't just walk in and out, uh, but it's geared up towards rehabilitation rather than punishment. And I suppose another difference would be that there's no set time. So if you get sentenced for murder, you either have a full life tariff, tariff, which means you're never leaving prison, or you have a limited tariff. In this kind of case, it's likely, I think, to be around the lines of 30, 40 years, which means that's the minimum amount of time before this person could leave uh, prison. They'd be assessed by the parole board. But if he goes under a hospital order, then it is literally as long as a piece of string. It's until he becomes safe. It could be many, many years could be decades, especially with this kind of level of risk, I think it'll be a very long time. So that's everything to do with medication, different types of therapy, uh, social work, occupational her uh, therapy, there's a whole system. And then when eventually he's deemed to, to be safe, he has like escorted leave with nurses, then unescorted leave. There's, there's an entire sort of system of people that work to try and make somebody safe for eventual discharge. Now, as I'm saying all this, I can imagine that there's probably, you dear, my dear viewers, a site for all guys and gals, two schools of thought. I think that some of you will think that regardless of whether he had a mental illness, that's irrelevant. What he did was so horrific. The lives that he damaged were so intense that he should just be punished. He should be sent to prison. They should lock him up and throw away the key. I imagine that some of you, like myself, would probably think that if, and it's a big if, I am speculating, this is driven by mental illness and he didn't know what he was doing. If this, if, if, if he was driven by these psychotic symptoms that decreased his criminal responsibility, then he deserves to be rehabilitated and made safe in the future. 
So my question for you, dear viewers, and let me know in the Shmomit Shmection, is what do you think? Do you think that he deserves a chance of redemption if he was mentally ill? Let me know. Um, the other thing that's just occurred to me is, is, I hadn't mentioned this, but there's a possibility of drug-induced psychosis. So I'm not saying drug intoxication, where somebody is just high and aggressive. I'm talking about a state of psychosis like I was talking about, but triggered by intense drug use. And this could fit that pattern. I mean, he certainly somebody that's agitated, it's certainly impulsive and came out of nowhere. He doesn't have a history of previous offending. He's got mental health issues. That's it's a possibility. The difference between that and what I've been talking about before is firstly, you can't get psychiatric defense if you became voluntary intoxicated. And there's no need for rehabilitation because once the drugs come out of your system, then your psychosis goes away. Typically within two or three days, sometimes a few weeks maximum, but there's nothing to rehabilitate. There's no need, there's no point in using the resources of a high security unit because whatever delusional beliefs you had, if it's a drug induced psychosis, will go before, uh, will, will resolve within a few days. I've actually got another video on this channel about a Wu-Tang rapper affiliate called Christbearer who had a drug induced psychosis and he cut off an appendage of his body. I'll let you guess what that appendage is. You can watch the video, I'll put it in the links. Um, okay, and that's all I have to say on this case. Uh, if you watch my channel closely, you will probably have noticed that I've been cheating recently and I haven't really released many new videos at all. Uh, I've just been really, 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 really busy, so I do apologise. I will get back to it if and when I have time. The last comment I wanted to make is, again, I just wanted to share my condolences with everybody involved in this tragedy, the family of the victims especially. Uh, yeah, I'm sure you'll notice that I've not made any jokes in this video like I usually do. I'm usually silly or surreal, but... I totally appreciate this is not a laughing matter. So yeah, those are my thoughts. Um, I hope what I've said to you has been educational, maybe slightly entertaining, give you an insight of how mentally ill offenders who commit murder, how they're processed and, and how they're, they're treated potentially differently to the average prisoner. Okay, that's it. Have a blessed day and I'll see you during my next video.